Welcome everyone. Tonight's program is Resume Writing with Kate Points. Kate comes to us from the main Jobs and Recovery Plan Career Advancement, and she's a Navigation Specialist supporting adult education programs throughout York County. So welcome, Kate, and let's get started in resume writing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So my name is Kate. Um, I come to this job from a background in education. I taught in high schools. The class that I taught most often is called professional communications, which is kind of what it sounds like teaching people how to communicate in a professional manner, which included resumes. So I worked on resume prep, job interview prep, um, how to write formal emails, how to communicate in group settings, all of those great things to high school students. Um, and then my family relocated to Maine and this job was recommended to me and it was a nice fit with given my previous experience teaching resumes. Um, so this is a new job to the state. We've been in this position for a year. There are four career advancement and navigation specialists across the state. Um, like Sharon said, I serve everybody in York County. So whether somebody is affiliated with an adult education program or not, I'm happy to work with them. And I even work with people who are outside of York County too, and if that makes sense for them. Um, so let's talk about resumes. I think that for a lot of people, resumes feel hard and difficult. And something that I've really discovered is that there's a pattern and we can make it easy. Um, my favorite thing is when somebody comes in and they're like, I don't know how to write a resume and we finish one in an hour. Um, I also support programming at the York County Jail and the administrator there was like, yeah, in a six week class, you could write a resume in six weeks. And I was like, six, we're going to do it in two. And they couldn't believe that I could actually do that. So uh, I think that once you demystify resumes, I think it gets a lot easier. So as you might know, a resume is a summary of your qualifications and your experience. It's not everything you've ever done. Um, think of it like a snapshot, like a black and white snapshot. So it's not even a color snapshot. It's just a quick, uh, quick look at the things that you've done. Um, when you first apply for a job, the first time human eyes see it, they scan maybe five or six seconds. So the formatting is really important. Having keywords is really important from the job description um, and making sure that it really does like highlight the things that you want to say about yourself. So with that said, um, I think that there's some different ways we can structure a resume. So uh, you have an example of a resume in front of you. Um, this is a resume for Sally Smith, who is a fictional person. Uh, I kind of thought about somebody who um, maybe had some entry level positions, was transitioning into a professional career, and was maybe thinking about what her other trajectory could be. So obviously everybody's resume is gonna look different as far as their experience. The first section on a resume, the profile section, is technically optional. Not everybody is going to have a profile section. Um, it used to be, back in the day, five years ago even, um, that people wrote objective statements. And nobody really writes objective statements anymore because the objective of a resume is to get a job. And everybody knows that. <laughs> so we don't have to write an objective resume anymore. Instead, uh, I really like a profile statement, something to kind of like summarize who you are, um, and what you would bring to the employer. It doesn't have to be long, two lines of text maximum, so not even two full sentences. And um, some resumes don't even have a profile section, so that's also completely optional. The next things that you want to have on your resume, it's really important to think about what you want to highlight. What do you think is the important thing for the employer to know about you? I like starting with skills because that's what employers really do want to know. What can you do for me? What can you do? Do you have the skills to do this job? What skills do you have? Will your skills match what I'm looking for? So I really like starting with skills. Um, there are two handouts that you have with all different kinds of skill words because sometimes when I sit down to write a resume or when I'm thinking about things, I'm like, I don't know any words anymore. What even are words? So I think having these list of skills is really helpful. Um, the one with the black bar, the list of soft skills, um, has them organized in types of soft skills. I think the, 
uh, communication skills are always really important. Critical thinking skills are always really important. Um, I really like to make sure that those are on resumes if the person feels like it applies to them. Um, things like problem solver, things like able to troubleshoot, things like you know desire to learn, willingness to learn, um, can really show the employer that you're ready to take on whatever role they have. The other skills page that you have, the one that has the gray boxes on it, um, has some of the same skills. There's some topics or categories that are the same. There's some that are different. Some of the words are like the descriptive words are the same. Some are different. So I think it's just a great, uh, both of those lists are just great lists to have. I would like people who work with me for resume consults, I would like them to find at least 12. I like a dozen skills. Don't always put 12 on the resume um, because sometimes when they're looking at a job post for a job that they really want, they really want to make sure that their resume really matches this job. We want to make sure we have room for some additional skills from the job posting. But 12 is a good place to start. Some people like their work experience first on the resume. Um, I think that used to be really popular was to have um, the chronological resume, your work experience in reverse order. So your current job or your most recent job and then walking backwards. Um, that format, that chronological format is still really common. But something that I think has changed is employers don't really need to know every job that you've ever done. If you're applying for a government job like at the shipyard, that's a little bit different. So we'll just ignore those. <laughs> um, but if you're applying for just like what I call a regular job, a non-government job, um, just the jobs that are relevant. You don't need every single job. So if you have had a continuous work history going back 10 years is fine. Or you could pick three jobs or four jobs that are relevant for that specific job. If you're somebody who has done a lot of different things, you might think about, um, you know, what jobs do I have I had where I sh have showcased this experience that this company is looking for. I'm trying to think what else I want to say about that. Oh, if you just do decide not to do the chronological and not to do every single job going back 10 years, I would title that section relevant experience or related experience. And that's just kind of a clue to the employer, to the hiring manager that you've done some other stuff. Um, some people get a little bit worried that that might show a gap in your employment. I think those of us um, at a certain age were drilled into like, you have to build your resume. You can't have a gap in your resume. What if you have a gap in your work history? And the world that we live in now just isn't that way. So many people have gaps in their work history, especially coming out of COVID. Um, so many people take time out of the workforce to be a caregiver or for different reasons. So I think that having a gap on your resume is not the horrific thing that people used to think it is. It was that rather. Kate, what did you call that instead of the experience you called it? Related experience or relevant experience? So then while we're thinking about your experience, um, you want to have, I would say, three to five bullet points underneath each job. Think about that description of what you did as like action plus result. So what action did you take? What was the result from it? Um, you also have a list of action verbs. The like the sideways paper. Because I always get working on a resume and I'm like, oh, I did filing. Did, what's a better word for did? And then I can't think of anything. So that's another just kind of helpful thing um, to give you, guys, give you some ideas uh, when you are thinking about your descriptions, thinking about your experiences. Something that I really like that is not technically cheating is Googling action words for resume and then fill in the blank with um, whatever job you're looking for. So if you are looking for an, an administrative assistant position, action words for administrative assistant resume, and then you can kind of find some different words, see if it would apply to your situation, see if it would apply to your experience. Um, you can also do that with skills, by the way. So I work with a lot of people who are getting into, for example, like pharmacy technician for the first time. They've never been a pharmacy technician. They've done the training. They've passed the exam. But now they have to write a resume for a job they've never really done. So we Google, what skills do pharmacy technicians need? 
attention to detail, meticulousness, right? So we kind of cherry pick some of those and put in the, put in there. So Google can absolutely be your friend in this case. On this example resume, the education is pretty far down. I feel like it used to be the standard was to have your education first. And I don't think that's always necessarily very important. If you are a new college grad and you don't have a lot of work experience, then having your education first might be a choice that you would want to make. But if you are, I would say, five years out of high school, five years out of college, and you do have some work experience, I would move your education down. Because for the most part, it doesn't matter what your education is. It matters what you can do. It matters your skills, it matters your experience, it matters what you're willing to take on. So I don't think it's very important to have your education high on your resume. It should be on there for sure, but I don't think it needs to be like at the top. Something that's tricky about education is your date of graduation. So for some of us, um, that puts us in a certain age category. If you are a person over 40, that puts you in a protected class for employment. So if you have, you know, the year you graduated high school or the year you graduated college on your resume, employers can kind of do the math and think about that. Obviously, being a protected class for employment, they can't outright discriminate against you, but discrimination is super hard to prove. So unless you're a recent grad within five years, just take it off your resume. No need to have the, the graduation date on there. And I think that's a really big change. That's a really big change. Then how does that affect your experience? If your jobs have been, you have more long-term in your jobs, like six, eight, ten years. Mm -hmm. So if you're putting your dates, like your, your example uses dates, they can figure that out too. That's true. Um, but they don't necessarily know when you started, how old you were when you started work, right? So they could do the math and say, oh, well, six years here, five years here, seven years here. That means this person has been working for this many years. They're likely to be at least this old. But um, it's a little bit, they have to do a little bit more math, I guess, that way. With the experience, I think you do need the dates still, unfortunately. All right, on the example resume, I have a separate section for certification and training. Depending on how much space you have on your resume, depending on if you need to shrink things or expand things to make the formatting the way that you want it to be, you could have education and certification or education and training um, as all one section and list all of those things under the same section. That's a personal choice, up to you. And of course, some people don't necessarily have certifications for their job. Um, I have teaching certifications from my previous jobs. I don't have a certification to do this current job. So if I wasn't looking for jobs in education, I might not have any certifications on my resume at all. And then the last section is really optional. Um, this is my personal pet peeve with Google. So if anybody has any connections at Google. Um, on the Google templates, the last section is awards and achievements. Most of us aren't going to have awards or specific achievements that we want to put on a resume. Um, I think that's really tailored for students maybe or for younger people who do have like um, student council or those kind of other positions that they would want to capture on a resume somehow. So I always change it to community engagement when I do a sample resume. So this resume is community engagement on it. Um, but not everybody has community engagement either. So if that doesn't apply to you, you can just take it off entirely. If you do choose to highlight some community engagement, I would think about writing the description for your role exactly the same as you would for a job description. So action verb plus results. What did I do? What was the outcome? You want to really highlight like your role in it, your agency, and what you did. And so I mentioned templates. Um, both Google Docs and Microsoft Word have some templates for resumes. Um, there are other more creative templates. Canva is really popular um, for more creative styles. Google Docs, for my opinion, is the simplest, easiest way to access a resume template. Um, I think they have the 
uh, least frills, let's say, but in a positive way. I think that there's the choices on Microsoft Word can be very overwhelming. There's too many styles. It's hard to know. And Google Docs has five. A lot easier to pick from just five choices instead of 20 choices. And then the benefit of Google Docs is that you can access it on, on any computer. So if you came in here and you worked on your resume at the library and then you went home and you worked on it on your computer at home or on a cousin's computer, you could still access it and you wouldn't have to worry about transferring the file between computers. So that's my preference is Google Docs. But I think that no matter what, you should use a template to write your resume because then it takes all the guesswork of the formatting out and it just it's, makes it so much more seamless. You don't have to worry about the font, you don't have to worry about the spacing, you don't have to worry about the margins. Um, unless we need to be creative about getting it to fit on one page. And that's something that I'm actually like super good at is working on those, oh, we can take out this space between paragraphs here, we can change this margin here. Um, and that kind of like being detail oriented about it is something that I secretly really love to do. <laughs> uh, so I think that having a one page resume is kind of the ideal should definitely not be more than two pages. So if you were to print it out and you meet an employer and you hand them your resume, it's just one page, they can look at it front and back and they're not flipping through 17 different pa papers. Um, when I was in high school and in college, there was a lot of talk about resume building and I had the impression that you wanted to have a longer resume, that the more things you add on your resume, the better. And that's just not the case. Seven seconds, six seconds, the shorter it can be, the better. That means that you have to cut a lot, unfortunately. Um, I am really proud of a job that I had at, right after college. I was a summer camp director. I developed and ran and coordinated a figure skating camp for like seven years and I loved it. It was amazing. It was so fun. I did hiring. I did staffing. I had a lot of leadership position with it. Um, but it's not relevant to any job I've ever done since then. So at some point it had to come off my resume and you just like shed a little tear, take a minute to think about it and then there it is delete it's gone unfortunately so the gold standard is still one page one page not front and back just front just front just front but, uh, just to get back to what you said some of us are older so we have relevant experience too so is it more accepted if you're an older candidate i don't know how to phrase it yeah so it down. Yeah, it depends um, because if you do have 20 years of work experience, 30 years of work experience, longer than that, you still only need really 10 on your resume. You still only need Yeah, you still time. really only need to go back 10 years. Okay. The exception would be if you had a job 15 years ago that the skills really overlap for the new jobs or the new roles that you're applying yeah. for. Yeah. That would be the exception and then I would do relevant experience and like okay. cut out something yeah. that was more recent. All right, what other questions? I think those are all the topics I wanted to make sure I hit on. You talk about, you know, the naming, a, I think a skill or, yeah, naming a skill in the outcome. Mm -hmm. But I don't see Action it on, word. Action word and results. Action word and result. I don't see it on Sally's. Is okay, so when we look at under Jones Insurance, yeah. answered phones and greeted clients. Right, oh, so, so that, that was her at, yeah. Okay. Manage calendar and schedule for staff of three agents. Okay. Developed and managed social media outreach. So we kind of talk about that anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not. Yeah, so instead of saying like responsible for social media outreach, yes. you would say developed and managed social okay. media outreach. And then another thing I noticed which was very interesting in the soft skills self-management emotionally stable yeah that's an interesting that's one kind of, yeah that's a really interesting one i think that for some jobs that can be really important to demonstrate that kind of patience um easygoing attitude um you know you can imagine in like a call center customer service, right? Um, 
you know, nobody, well, some, I guess some people call customer service with good things to say, but mostly if you're on the phone with customer service, it's because you have an issue you need resolved, right? So being able to control your emotions, be, you know, ha keep your, keep your emotions in check, stay patient, you know, those would be really great attributes for that job. I don't know that I would phrase it as emotionally stable, probably. I know, I don't think I would. But I think like that idea, we could work to capture that idea in different ways. Um, something that a lot of people, I guess, get tripped up by or feel overwhelmed by, um, the advice is really to tailor your resume for every job, and that feels so overwhelming. And so my recommendation for that is to make one master resume that can have all of your 30 years of work experience. Think of it like a database for you. So that would not be a resume that you would give to anybody, but you could make a copy of that file and take off the stuff that isn't relevant um, or change some things and still keep your whole database of all of your experience, all of your skills, uh, I guess, intact. Um, and that way it's there for you to go back to if you need to, to add to it or update it. Um, so that makes it easier to update resumes per job. And I think usually too, if you get a really solid draft of a general resume, it's easy to update the skills or it's easy to rephrase your profile statement. Um, the bulk of the resume, the experience, the things that you did at your job probably are gonna stay the same. Uh, when I work with people who have been at a job for, I worked with somebody who had been at a job for 25 years and she was like, in all of this time, I would spend five pages writing what I did at this job. And I said, okay, if you can only tell me one thing you did at that job, what's your one thing? And she thought about it for a minute, we wrote it down. I was like, okay, if you can tell me a second thing. What's the second most important thing? And so that can be, if you do have too much that you need to edit down, that can be really helpful. What are the most important things? If I only get to say three things, I really need to choose my words carefully and make sure that I'm saying the three most important things about my job. And so three is the magic number under... Three to five. Okay. Three to five. Five is okay. Three to five. I have three on mine um, just to keep it balanced, honestly. <laughs> uh, and just to make sure that there was room for all of the sections that I wanted to show on a sample resume. It is a, a skill to fit it, to fit it all in, on one page. Yeah. It's tough. It can be tough. So then using that example of this person who worked 20 years at this job, how then is that, what does that resume look like if you are saying you don't necessarily have to go back, just go back 10 years? I get that with today's climate of people don't stay in jobs, but if somebody stayed in a job 20 years, res how do you fill out your resume so it looks like something when you know the person on the other side goes, oh, there's three lines. Yeah, so it's yeah. not just a half a page on the resume. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in 20 years, they probably had some different roles, right? So you could think about, um, especially if you had like a leadership role and then a role that was maybe a little bit more collaborative or something like that. Um, or if you moved locations or, um, you know, you became a trainer, all these different like ways people's careers, you know, kind of move and and, and shift around. So that that would be something that I would really consider with them. Is you know, in this role as trainer, what were some things you did that were different from your other roles? In this role as shift supervisor, what were some things that you did that were different from the rest of your time there? And so you could kind of use that to fill out your space a little bit. But you still only have one job on there. It would depend. It would depend, I think. Um, you know, if you've been at some place for 20 years, 
that might be where you bring in your favorite job that was seven years because some of the things that you did actually pertain to the person, the job you're applying for. Yeah. Yeah, you could. Even though it might be 25 years ago. Yep. Um, you could also, depending on the type of job it was, you could also look at if there were like certain projects. Um, if you, so I don't that know. Fills out like your skills yeah. section might become larger. Yeah. Your training or your certification or. Yeah. Because you have knowledge. I mean, you might have knowledge of computer programs. Yeah. You could. Put in, put in there. Yeah, so you could have like your work experience and then sometimes people will have other experience if they had like a side gig, for example. They taught the robotics club after school at the local middle school, something like that. But it was it was like sort of like a hobby that they did. And so they could frame it more as work experience and not volunteering necessarily. So just to be clear, related or related experience mm -hmm. is perfectly acceptable now. Yep. Okay. Yep, absolutely. So that would get around the being at one place 21 years where you're looking for a whole different skill set somewhere else. You'd look at what they're looking for and somewhere in there. Yeah, so I think like the the times that I would advise people to use related experience is if they worked, they were an admin assistant somewhere and then they had to take time off because they were a caretaker and then they worked at Dunkin Donuts because it was a flexible shift that they could get in a little bit of extra money while the kid was in school or while they had respite care or whatever. And then they were, went back and did um, office manager somewhere. And then later they decided that they actually didn't want to work anymore because, I don't know, they won the lottery or something. Um, but they did, I'm trying to think of like a fun job. They were a lifeguard in the summer. So they were a lifeguard at the you know town beach in the summer. Um, and so if then if you decide, actually, I really do want to go back and have a career as an office manager again, then you could use related experience and just have the office manager admin assistant and not include the Dunkin' Donuts and the lifeguard, those kinds of things. For somebody who has been at a job for 20 years, I would just call it experience or work experience. Okay. But you might have more than three bullets and five yes. bullets, especially if you're doing you're a teacher in a school, but you're doing advising this club here and advising yep. that and you're coaching over there. Those could be yep. underneath that different school, roles, different roles within mm -hmm. that experience. Yep, absolutely. And then I guess my last like piece of advice or thing about the resume um, is to think of it as a living document. Your resume isn't ever really finished. Um, if you are currently in the workforce taking 10 minutes every six months or every quarter to just kind of like update, like, oh, did I, did I do any new skills? Oh, did I take on any new projects? Oh, did I, am I doing something? Has my role changed since this time last year? And thinking about those kind of updates because it's easier to do while it's fresh in your mind than if you have to go back and say, oh, what did I do three years ago? <laughs> what was happening? <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, so I would always just kind of like, you know, set yourself a reminder in your calendar and just periodically just check in. True. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so we talked about your resume being like a snapshot. So you want to really make sure that you shine and some people, I don't want to say misrepresent, but, you know, use words or phrases that proficient for example means different things I'm proficient in Microsoft Word does that mean that you know how to open the program and you can do a blank document does that you know all the shortcuts and all the tips and tricks and all the different menus like what does proficient actually mean right I'm proficient in Excel I can manage a basic spreadsheet don't ask me to do any formulas beyond like adding a totaling a column right so that that kind of word proficient could mean different things 
Um, and if you are using it in a way that's like, I'm proficient in, in Excel, like for me, I should be prepared to talk about what that means. You know, be, be prepared with my answer if they do say like, oh, what's your level of skill with Excel? I know how to use the help menu really well. Yeah. I can. <laughs> um, so you just want to make sure it's all true. Like I wouldn't say that I know, uh, I know how to code, for example. I don't know how to code. I can't write an HTML script. So like I should not write that on my resume. But like proficient in Microsoft Word, proficient in Microsoft Office, that's something that I could get away with. I brought mine with me, but I don't what know do if you I do want about, to um, you don't have to about okay. references. Mm, references. Good question. So it used to be really common with references to say references available upon request on the bottom of your resume. I kind of feel like with the objective statement, that's just a thing that's understood. You are going to be asked for references. You should have references prepared. Typically, especially with online job applications, now that's part of the application yeah. package. So you do not need to write references on your resume. You do not need to write references available upon request. Um, if, if you are just like cold emailing your resume or if you're sending your resume to somebody for consideration, they understand that you will have references if you choose to go through the process, if they choose to have you go through the process, that there will be a part of the application where you are expected to put in your references. And my experience in the past, uh, I'll say 15 years or so, most of them are requested digitally. Mm. Yeah. And you don't often hear back. Yep. You you know, you're you take the time to get this the exact way you want it and you put a lot of effort into it and you send it off and you never hear back. You wait and Yep. And I think that's it's so frustrating. Yeah, I think that I think that people, because you are doing job searching online, people can apply to so many different jobs. When you used to have to drive somewhere or walk somewhere and ask for an application and fill it out and then hand it in, that took a lot of effort on your part, physical effort on your part. So you applied for the jobs that you wanted, that you thought were relevant, that you thought would apply to you. Um, and you didn't necessarily apply to any job that you're like, yeah, maybe, sure, I'll give that a shot, why not? And now, because we look for jobs online, those kind of like, yeah, sure, maybe, those applications are a lot more common. So I think that probably for most jobs, there's a lot more people applying. And so the people who don't make the cut, if, you have to, if you're in a, the hiring manager and you have to go through 50 resumes or 50 applications, you know, you're just gonna notify the five people, 10 people, that you want to talk to. It is really frustrating though because it's like, what happened? Is this just a long job search? Like, are, are they taking forever? Yeah. And so I think it's all, also really good when you do submit an application, send a follow up email. Yeah. I applied for this job. I'm attaching my resume for your convenience. Happy to answer any questions. Happy to provide any further information that may help. And then at least it's a point of contact and they still might not reply. Right. But at least it makes it a little, a little easier for the people to say, like, great, thanks, we're going in a different direction, or something like that. So that's like your secondary contact. You sent in your resume, and now you're doing a secondary. I sent you my resume, just one. Is that what you just said? I mean, yeah, so when you do a job application, they're mostly online now, mm -hmm. right? So you do the job application online, you send it in, it goes into the blank void of the internet and maybe they got it maybe they didn't you don't know it's not like you're like handing it to somebody you know like when you write it on paper so then by if you have a contact there or if you can find a contact sending your resume and just kind of like doing that follow-up I applied for this such and such job and I would say what job you applied for because chances are the hiring manager is responsible for more than one position so I applied for library director I'm attaching my resume for your convenience Please let me know if you need any more information. Something along those lines. That's 
Nazi initiative. We used to call it initiative in the old days, didn't we, Jane? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little extra. Mm -hmm. You have to. You have to. You look like you're going to ask another question or say something else. No, I brought my resume with me, but I really didn't want to have all my personal stuff out of we, it. We wouldn't take that. Okay. Yeah. No. No, I think that you answered a lot of the questions that I Good. were thinking These of. Are Good. very helpful resources. So I guess like the last thing we didn't specifically talk about is doing a resume on LinkedIn or on Indeed. They have those resume builders. And I think that can be really helpful. A lot of times that's how um, recruitment companies or how employers will first filter their search. Does this person have the qualifications that match? It, may, it does make it a little bit easier if you were like a passive job search person, like oh, I'm pretty happy with my job, but like, you know, maybe if there's something else out there, but I don't want another job bad enough to actually like look for one. But if there's a recruiter who wants to email me, I'll listen, sure. So having a resume through LinkedIn or through Indeed for that purpose, I think is really helpful. I do really like having the paper copy so that you can attach it in an email. And when you download your resume from LinkedIn or download it from Indeed, um, the format is not as nice. It prints on like three or four pages. It's, it's a, it's a, it can be a little bit difficult to look at. So I think having both that's always my advice. Do both. So when that person reaches out to you through Indeed and says, I'd like to talk to you about your resume, that's when you would follow up with the email with your attachment of your resume. So in this situation, we're assuming that you haven't reached out to them first. Right. That my resume, my profile is on Indeed. Sharon's hiring for a new front desk attendant or new children's librarian. So she's just kind of like casually looking, oh, Sally Smith has a children's librarian experience. This is somebody that maybe would be interested. I'm gonna send her an email or I'm gonna send a message to see if this is a position she'd consider. And so usually those kind of recruitment pitches sound like I'm hiring for a children's librarian in Berwick, Maine. Is this a position you'd like to learn more about? Let's schedule some time to talk. And then you could say like, yes, let's talk some more or no, thank you. I'm not actually a children's librarian um, or whatever it is. <laughs> so when I would say yes, I would also include I'm attaching my resume for your convenience, that kind of a thing and do it right then so that they get your my formatted yeah. the way I want it to look, not however they're printing it out off of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could. I would say that's a personal preference because sometimes with those like initial contacts, you're like, Yes, I'm very excited about this job. Please tell me more. Let's do an interview. Great. And sometimes you're like, I don't really know. This is in Prescott, Arizona. I don't really want to move to Arizona. But if they're going to offer me a half a million a year, I guess I should consider that. So I'll listen. So in that situation where you're like, I don't really know how invested I am, then I would just say like, yes, let's schedule a time to talk. And then from there, you could send it if you decide to move forward. Yeah, that kind of employer contact and job interviews, like we could do a whole other, other session about that. We could. <laughs> Especially for people re-entering the job force, you know. Yeah. COVID, so many, so many things changed. Yeah, and how do you talk about taking time off? Like people will get really worried about that gap in their resume. They think they're not going to be employable anymore. Yeah. Well, they did drill things like that into our heads. I know. And it's just, the world has changed. It has. Yeah. Well, this has been great, Kate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Did you have any other things you wanted to say or share? Nope. Um, I'm available for appointments in general. Um, as part of the main jobs and recovery plan, all of my services are at no cost. So anybody can email me, call me, contact me. I'm happy to look at resumes, happy to talk about job interviews, happy to help you look for a job, whatever would help you reach your career goals. So 
yeah, if you think that's something that would benefit you, let's talk.